dear Mr. Trump, declare victory if you want to prance around in public, but please just go away and let us move towards peace, denuclearization, and disarmament. And the plea could hardly be more clear. I think if you would look up the meaning in the dictionary of leader, you could do worse than see a picture of Sally Jones. Sally Jones is certainly one of the strongest leaders in peace action. She's the president of the Peace Action Fund of New York State. She is the International Peace Bureau's representative to the United Nations, a member of the Peace and Planet Steering Committee, and an indefatigable organizer for peace and justice. Sally Jones. On behalf of the International Peace Bureau, I am honored to be their UN representative here in New York. Uh, I work with Cora Weiss, and uh, it has been uh, a, an excellent experience. I got involved with the peace movement. I'm, I'm really not from uh, the, a long history of many of you here. I worked as a, in technology, just a regular day job. I just retired from my day job last year. Uh, but I really believe in community work and community organizing and grassroots organizing. So in 2002, on the run-up to the Iraq War, I was distraught. I was totally distraught. And we and other people where I live on Staten Island said we have to do something. We have to put together some kind of anti-war group. And someone suggested peace action as, you know, why not make a chapter of peace action? So that's what we did. I am really grateful for somebody making that connection because, as you know here, it's important to make connections, not just with your neighbors, but with people in your city, around the block, around the state, around the country. And now, through the work I did with Peace Action, I have met people from around the world. And it has been an eye-opening experience. Not something I expected to do, and probably many of you fell into this some way like that, but that's the message. We have to keep moving forward. I just was talking to Julian, who you'll hear from shortly, about how in the world did New York City elect Rudy Giuliani as mayor? How did that happen? And I had to think about that, but I know David Dinkins was the mayor prior to Rudy Giuliani. And we had a backlash here in New York City, if you remember. And then, thinking today, how did Trump get elected? Well, we had another backlash. And it's been a, a real blow, a body blow to, I know, to me, and I'm sure to many of you. But over time, people worked hard. Since Rudy Giuliani, you know, we had set, a lot of setbacks, but people worked really hard. And now we have a more progressive city council, we have a more progressive mayor. So I have hope that all of us are going to work hard. And to me, this is the most important congressional election in my lifetime. And I am 69 years old. So I've been, I've seen some really bad things. And I don't know, I'm telling everybody, I just had the experience of going around to our campus chapters. I'm uh, the chair of Peace Action Fund of New York State. We have 18 student chapters around the state, and we did a tour upstate. We were in Canisius College, a Jesuit college in Buffalo, and the young leader there said, introduce yourself by naming your passion, and everybody did. And I realized my passion is our peace voter campaign, because I'm hoping that that will be a way we can inject foreign policy into our congressional elections. And I urge all of you to figure out a way of doing that in some way, making a difference. We have to keep this work going, moving forward, and I am so honored to be in your presence here today. Welcome, all of you. 
We have a special guest who's not on your program, but is no less important for that. Uh, Julian Lopez Leva is a nonviolent advocate and criminal justice student at Bunker Hill College in Boston. He is looking to go to law school to further the causes of social and economic justice within a multicultural framework. He was one of the big organizers and a catalyst, the student leader for Boston's March for Our Lives with approximately 40,000 people in attendance. Please give Julian a, well, a warm welcome. Good morning, AFSC, Peace Action, the Judson Church community. Good morning, New York. It may be a discomforting truth Almost a thin air, some American turn of events has landed us here. Between stained glass windows, under a heaven-aiming chapel, we sit almost in mass to confront the Goliathian threats, these nuclear notions that have again crept into the consciousness of a nation and imposed upon a larger world. Unified by a common calling to peace, we appeal to neighbors, to strangers, that our skies must be kept clear, that our cities are unscathed by fear, and that our lives, and the lives of every woman, child, and man, from Manhattan to Damascus to the Florida Parklands, are not negligible. Now, I am not here to dismiss what's only a sensible, unethical worry, a worry for the sake of international armistice, a worry for the sake of multilateral agreements to the adherence of them and for the attainment of unreserved nuclear abolition. I'm not here to dispel with the rightful urgency to organize and resist the myriad nuclear threats, brinkmanship, foreign and domestic, that doubts our security, our well-being, and gambles our futures. But by any direction our nation's utters row towards, by any rush of these crazy winds that today carry us, do know that in the name of nonviolence, the kids are unquiet. And what I have come to realize in, under, in organizing Boston's March for Our Lives is a youthful, invulnerable commitment to change that from tragedy-stricken South Florida suburbs emerge faces of stone-like, messianic, and emancipated bravery. Emerged a notion, an idea, not unlike ours here today, that no life should be vanquished by senseless impulse in the streets or in the schools or in Syria or anywhere. That every soul is entitled to long, unfearing, and cornucopian futures. To these ends, and through our rallying cry of not one more, do recognize sisters and brothers, friends, and colleagues that the kids are unquiet. This, this is what I am here for. In a movement to diminish gun violence, to abolish nuclear violence, we are not yet at ease, but we are not alone. A new generation now stands beside you, behind you. We are one raised of Columbines and Katrinas, recessions, wars, a resurgence in malicious nationalism. But we are likewise unconvinced that the world must carry on this way. So at the crossroads of a new millennium, we stand suspended, but not silent. We are uncomfortable where we are, but not uncaring. We may be dizzied, but we angle in the direction of righteousness. I do not know where this river flows, but I know this by the millions who march to reject gun violence on March 24th, by the example of all whom, who marched bled and died in great movements years past that have came far before us and will continue far ahead of us, many of which and many of whom are with us today by our unmatched connectedness and our obligation to the rest of the world. And in the name of nonviolence, a bravest generation I know has been conceived. Thank you. Uh, 
I know it's a cliche when the MC says the next guest needs no introduction, particularly to this audience, uh, but I'm going to do him at least a little bit of uh, justice by uh, giving a brief introduction. Noam Chomsky is a linguist, philosopher, cognitive science, uh, scientist, historian, social critic, political activist. Uh, a lot of his work has certainly influenced me. Uh, his terrific uh, speaking out on behalf of the people of East Timor was something that helped inform my work. Also his uh, manufacturing consent I think was very influential for me in thinking about how we do our media work. Of course, his real job is linguistics professor, and he's known as the father of modern linguistics. He holds a joint appointment at the, uh, as an institute uh, professor emeritus at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and a laureate professor at the University of Arizona, and is the author of over 100 books. And as a Pennsylvania native myself, I like to remind people that he is a proud son of the Commonwealth uh, of Pennsylvania, and particularly the city of brotherly love. And I told him I was going to do something that no one's probably ever done in introducing him, which is that he is from Philadelphia, home of your world champion Philadelphia Eagles. E-A-G-L-E-S, Eagles. I'm sure no one's ever done that because probably you don't care about football, but also because the Eagles haven't won the championship in 57 years. <laughs> I couldn't resist. But in all seriousness, where else would you rather be than here this morning to hear Professor Noam Chomsky? I guess I should pick up on the introduction by saying that uh, every Jewish kid of boy of my age who grew up in Philadelphia uh, has an inferiority complex because in the 1930s the Philadelphia teams lost, they were at the bottom of every league <laughs> and our cousins were in New York where they were at the top of every league so it was a terrible experience. <laughs> but, uh, well, to get to the topic, uh, Dan Ellsberg uh, describes his uh, remarkable new book, which is uh, essential reading, as a chronicle of human madness. And the uh, record that's reviewed uh, uh, easily lives up to the title and uh, raises serious questions about uh, whether the human species is an evolutionary error. Uh, an objective and informed observer uh, might conclude that since World War II, the species has been dedicated to establishing the thesis that humans are simply a mistake. Uh, that actually should have occurred to everyone with eyes open on August 6, 1945, uh, Day that I remember all too vividly, uh, both the horrifying news and the uh, casual reaction to it. Actually, it resonated uh, when I read recently uh, William Perry's uh, comment that uh, he's doubly terrified, uh, both by the extreme and mounting dangers and by the lack of concern over the threat of terminal destruction. Uh, those uh, awful events of August 6th uh, taught us that uh, human intelligence in its glory had devised means of destruction that would surely soon escalate uh, to the point where a mass suicide would be imminent and that's indeed what has ensued. Uh, those familiar with the record will be aware that it's a near miracle that we've survived this far and such miracles cannot be expected to persist. It's all too easy to list flashpoints around the world you know, that might right now, tomorrow, explode to a terminal conflagration. And it's useful to remember that when the doomsday clock was first set back in 
1947, it was seven minutes to midnight, which seems like halcyon days today from our perspective. Well, in 1945, we did not yet know that the nuclear age, uh, the onset of the nuclear age, uh, coincided with the onset of a new geological epoch, a so-called Anthropocene, in which uh, humans are laboring, uh, not only to destroy organized human life, but many other species too, uh, because of the accompanying sixth extinction that proceeds along with the Anthropocene proceeds on its lethal course. Well, there have been debates about the onset of the Anthropocene, but uh, last year the World Geological Organization uh, settled on uh, the uh, on, on the, the end of uh, the beginning of the post-war era because of the sharp escalation in uh, environmental destruction that has taken place since that time. And uh, when the doomsday clock was moved to two minutes to midnight last January, uh, the accompanying statement opened by, I'll quote, warning of the failure to respond effectively to the looming threats of nuclear war and climate change, making the world security situation more dangerous than it was a year ago, and as dangerous as it has been since World War II, which I think is an understatement. Uh, our prime concern here is on the first of these threats, the nuclear age. Uh, but it's hard to avoid mention of the utterly astonishing fact that the most powerful state in human history with unparalleled advantages is not only refusing to join the rest of the world in making at least some effort to deal with the imminent and quite devastating threat of global warming, but worse yet, is devoting its energies to accelerating the race to destruction. And uh, all for the exalted purpose of stuffing a few more dollars into overstuffed pockets before we say goodbye to the hopes for survival. And also it's hard to mention the no less astonishing fact that so little notice is taken of this amazing spectacle. It's hard to find, you can't find a historical precedent for it. And what it all tells us about our society and our culture. And again, that's doubly terrifying. Uh, but let's uh, keep to the nuclear threat. Uh, there will be little disagreement here, I'm sure, on the compelling need to eliminate, to rid the earth of the scourge of nuclear weapons. And uh, others today will surely discuss the many ways to approach this goal. But I'd therefore like to say a few words about a different topic, different though clearly related, uh, one which I don't think receives the attention that it deserves. And uh, we might approach the topic that I have in mind by formulating a simple question that's worth some reflection. Uh, what would happen if political leaders decided to obey the supreme law of the land, uh, just our own laws, uh, in particular to obey the United Nations Charter, treaty made by the United States in the words of the Constitution, Article 6, and thus part of the supreme law of the land. Uh, that supreme law of the land obligates us to resort to peaceful means in the event of international disputes and to refrain from the threat, I stress threat, or use of force in international affairs. Uh, that's an obligation under the Constitution. And uh, you might ask yourself when that legal obligation was last observed by the president or any other high officials. Uh, we might, you know, the answer to that, and we might also reflect on what that means. Well, adherence to the supreme law of the land in the past uh, would have spared us uh, many tragedies, 
as well as some very near super tragedies. One crucial case instantly comes to mind, should not be forgotten, uh, adherence to the supreme law of the land would have saved us from what Arthur Schlesinger rightly called the most dangerous moment in history. Schlesinger's term for the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Uh, the frightening story should be familiar, I won't review it, except to mention that uh, Washington's, Kennedy's uh, terrorist war against Cuba, which of course was a serious violation of the U.S. Constitution, uh, was a significant factor in inducing Khrushchev to undertake the reckless act of placing missiles in Cuba, as scholarship now fully recognizes. Uh, Dan, uh, Dan Ellsberg, who, was, who followed the events closely from a privileged position uh, within the government at that time, he now concludes that the uh, terrorist war was probably the prime factor in Khrushchev's decision. Uh, the facts about that are not as well known as they should be, but you should recall that Kennedy's official plan for the terrorist war was formulated in Nas National Security Memorandum 181, September 1962, and I'll quote it, uh, the plan was to engineer an internal revolt in October that would be followed by U.S. military intervention. Now, that was a month before the missile crisis. And in fact, terror was being escalated at that point in preparation, and it was a very serious matter. Uh, the record reveals that quite clearly. And more than enough was surely known to Russia and China, uh, Cuba and Russia. Well, in brief, uh, respect for the U.S. Constitution would very likely have averted the most dangerous moment in history, and it was no small matter. Those of you familiar with it know that we escaped by a near miracle, and it's much too little understood. Well, legality aside, uh, there are perhaps some other reasons that other questions that might be raised about a murderous and destructive terrorist war. Uh, or so one might assume, but mistakenly. There's a review of uh, released government documents on the terrorist war by a Harvard Latin America scholar, Jorge Dominguez, and he writes that only once in these nearly thousand pages of documentation did a U.S. official raise something that resembled a faint moral objection to U.S. government-sponsored terrorism. A member of the National Security Council staff suggested that the terrorist raids are haphazard and kill innocents, which might mean a bad press in friendly countries. That's it. So perhaps it's not a good idea. Now that's it in a thousand pages of documentation. Uh, the terrorist war is a prime, if not the prime, example of, uh, that, uh, of the fact that engendered the crisis. And incidentally, for those of you who've read the uh, XCOM transcripts, you know, the detailed transcripts of the deliberations about the crisis, it is literally not mentioned once, not just doesn't matter. It's our right, uh, our right to conduct terrorist wars which lead to virtual destruction, and there's no need to even think about it. Very few people even know about it. Well, respect for elementary moral values, as well as respect for law, would have spared the world, very likely would have spared the world, this close brush with uh, terminal disaster. It's not the first time, it's not the last time, up till the moment. And the same guiding principles, that is, simply observing the law, uh, offer promising ways to deal with the crises that uh, led to, quote the doomsday clock announcement again, to led to a world security situation as dangerous as it has been since worldwide. World War II, 
That's the latest setting of the doomsday clock, uh, as close as it's come to terminal disaster since 1953, uh, when also two minutes to midnight when the uh, United States and later the Soviet Union exploded uh, thermonuclear weapons. So let's take a look at the uh, examples the, that are mentioned, the cases that are mentioned in the current doomsday clock statement. Well, the first one is North Korea. So has there been a diplomatic path in the case of the North Korea situation? Now, there is one possibility. It's been advanced by China for some years, support of Russia, intermittent support from North Korea. And that's a double freeze. Uh, North Korea would freeze its uh, development of nuclear weapons and missiles. Uh, the United States, in response, would cease its uh, military actions, threatening military actions on the borders. That includes uh, menacing uh, flights by uh, nuclear-capable uh, uh, bombers, the most advanced uh, U.S. bombers. And uh, that's not a laughing matter in a country that was flattened uh, by U.S. bombs, merciless U.S. bombing in easy memory. Uh, and uh, in fact, when there was nothing left to destroy because all the targets were done, uh, the U.S. Air Force simply uh, destroyed the dams. Uh, exultant comments about it in the official documents, the Air Force Quarterly. Uh, this was, if anybody cares, a crime for which uh, Nazi war criminals were hanged at Nuremberg. Well, a double freeze it would have opened the way to further negotiations. Uh, they might have gone as far as what, has what was achieved in 2005. And it's worth bearing in mind what that was because the press has been seriously distorting it. Uh, what happened in 2005 was that under international pressure, uh, President Bush agreed to enter into the six power negotiations and uh, there was success, substantial success. Uh, I'll quote, uh, North Korea agreed, I'm now quoting the agreement, North Korea agreed to abandon all nuclear weapons and existing weapons programs and allow international inspections. So let me repeat that because there are constant lies about it every time you open the newspaper. North Korea agreed to abandon all nuclear weapons and existing weapons programs and allow international inspections. Uh, the, uh, in return, the United States was to uh, provide a uh, light water reactor for medical use, uh, issue a non-aggression pledge, and join an agreement that the two sides, I'm quoting, would respect each other's sovereignty exist peacefully together and take steps to normalize relations. Now, that was 2005. So what happened? Instantly, within days, the Bush administration tore the agreement to shreds. It renewed the threat of force. It froze North Korean funds in foreign banks, and it disbanded the consortium that was to provide North Korea with a light water reactor. Uh, Bruce Cummings, the leading Korea scholar, as you know, uh, writes that the sanctions were specifically designed to destroy the September pledges and to head off the accommodation between Washington and Pyongyang. Now that's 2005. Uh, the, I won't review the press, common press uh, coverage of this, but open the newspaper and you'll see it. It says exactly the opposite. Uh, the path could have been pursued for several years, and now, as we know, there are even better options. So a couple of weeks ago, on April 27th, uh, North and South Korea launched, signed a historic document, Hanmunjom Declaration for Peace, Prosperity, Unification of the Korean Peninsula. And the words of the document are worth reading closely and carefully. In the declaration, I'm quoting it now, the two Koreas affirm the principle 
of determining the destiny of the Korean nation on their own accord. On their own accord. Those are very important words. Uh, they went on to call for to completely cease all hostile acts against each other in every domain, to actively cooperate to establish a permanent and solid peace regime on the Korean Peninsula, to carry out disarmament in a phased manner in order to achieve the common goal of realizing through complete denuclearization a nuclear-free Korean Peninsula, to strengthen the positive momentum towards continuous advancement of inter-Korean relations, as well as the peace, prosperity, and unification of the Korean Peninsula. And they further agreed to actively seek the support and cooperation of the international community, which means the United States, for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And uh, furthermore, as uh, Korea specialist uh, Chung In Moon reviews in a current issue of Foreign Affairs, Journal Foreign Affairs, uh, the two Koreas did not just make high-level commitments, I'm quoting him. They also laid out specific timetables for implementing them and took concrete steps that will have immediate effects in facilitating cooperation and preventing conflict, which is, as he points out, something new and significant. There have been agreements before, but never with this specificity. And again, it's important to read the words of the Declaration carefully. Uh, their import is very clear. The United States should back off and allow the two Koreas to achieve peace, disarmament, unification, and complete denuclearization. We should accept the call for support and cooperation of this, uh, with this endeavor on the part of the Korean nation, its two parts, to determine their destiny on their own accord. Crucial words of the Declaration. So to put it more simply, uh, the Declaration is a polite letter saying, Dear Mr. Trump, declare victory if you want to prance around in public, but please just go away and let us move towards peace, denuclearization, and disarmament. And the plea could hardly be more clear. It's very far from the interpretation here, and that's worth paying attention to as well. So the general reaction here was lucidly articulated by Mark Lander, foreign policy specialist in the New York Times. Uh, he explained that the declaration complicates Washington's strategy, quoting him. Mr. Trump will find it hard to threaten military action against a country that's extending an olive branch. That's true. It's pretty hard to threaten military action, which incidentally is a criminal act. Remember, the threat of force is a criminal act. And it's hard to do that when the target is extending an olive branch. So we really have some problems. Uh, it's clearly that, it's very clear that uh, peaceful means are available uh, to mitigate one of the most serious of the threats that's bringing the world as close to terminal disaster as it's been since World War II, since the onset of the nuclear age. And uh, citizen efforts can be significant, uh, maybe even decisive, in uh, realizing the prospects for peace in Northeast Asia uh, that now are indeed before us, in realizing uh, the, the efforts to ensure that Washington does not once again uh, undermine the prospects for peace in Northeast Asia. And I stress once again, since it is not the first time. It's also worth noting that uh, U.S. Uh, analysts have been very clear and quite frank about the real nature of the North Korean threat. So here's uh, foreign affairs commentator Max Fisher in the New York Times. 
He writes that North Korea has achieved what no country has since China developed its own program a half century ago, a nuclear deterrent against the United States. Uh, they've achieved that. And uh, Trump's threats and sanctions, he says, have not succeeded to reverse or stall these gains. So clearly we must do something to prevent anyone uh, from deterring our resort to force and violence. That's a fundamental principle of U.S. foreign policy. Well, let's turn to Iran, which poses a similar problem, similar to North Korea. Among specialists across the spectrum, political spectrum, you find very few who would disagree with the conclusion of the respected and properly conservative uh, International Institute of Strategic Studies. This is 2010 when there was still some thought that maybe Iran is developing nuclear weapons. Uh, they concluded that Iran's nuclear program and the willingness to keep open the possibility of developing nuclear weapons is a central part of its deterrent strategy. Uh, U.S. intelligence concurs. They were reporting to Congress regularly that the Iranian threat is part of their deterrent strategy. And again, it's intolerable to the two rogue states that rampage in the region that anyone should have a deterrent. Uh, well, there's much talk about Iran's possible uh, violations of the JCPOA, the joint program, the Iran deal, uh, even though the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, concurrence of U.S. intelligence has repeatedly given Iran a clean bill of health. Uh, there, however, is virtually no talk about the fact that the U.S. has been violating the agreement from the very beginning and is continuing to do so. So the U.S., if you read the agreement, uh, it uh, says the U.S. Uh, the U.S. has, in fact, been uh, repeatedly seeking to block Iran's reintegration into the global economy, uh, particularly the global financial system, which is controlled right here in New York and to undermine, I'm quoting the agreement, to undermine the normalization of trade and economic relations with Iran. Uh, all of that is in violation of the agreement, strict violation. It's ignored on the prevailing uh, tacit assumption that uh, the indispensable nation uh, stands above the law. Uh, well, Trump's decision a couple of days ago to effectively withdraw from the agreement uh, was not surprising. It was, of course, anticipated. And uh, contrary to what's all often said, uh, Trump is actually uh, highly predictable. He's constantly described as unpredictable, but that's simply untrue. Uh, in fact, uh, you can predict with close precision exactly what he's going to do uh, simply by recognizing the guiding principle, which is quite simple. The guiding principle is me, 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 exclamation mark. And there's a corollary, uh, namely if anything was done by the black demon, maybe Antichrist, uh, who proceeded, uh, then you do the opposite. Uh, just think through the policy decisions of the last couple of years and predicts it with virtual precision. So, uh, the, uh, and it just uh, doesn't matter what the consequences are, it's kind of irrelevant, uh, just like on destroying the climate, it's somebody else's business. And in this case, the consequences might be, we don't know, to induce Iranian hardliners to return to nuclear programs, which they had abandoned, uh, that could provide an opening for John Bolton, uh, Netanyahu, the rest of them, uh, to realize their openly stated goals of uh, direct aggression with consequences that range from uh, awful to horrendous. Well, are there peaceful options? I mean, in this quick case, the question simply doesn't even arise. Uh, the U.S. could rejoin the world, could permit the uh, 
JCPOA to function effectively as it's been doing. And perhaps the US might even refrain from regular and constant uh, violations of the agreement. All of that's a possibility. But actually, we can do a lot better than that. Now, there's one point on which I agree with President Trump. He's constantly talking about ways to improve the agreement. And there are ways, very interesting ways. And the most obvious and uh, constructive ones, for some odd reason, are never mentioned. So let me mention them. The agreement could be extended to, a to moving towards establishing a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. Uh, the spread of such zones around the world is valuable in itself for mitigating threats, uh, but it also has symbolic significance of no slight importance in simply uh, uh, as an expression of the global determination to rid the world of these monstrous devices. And in the troubled Middle East region, it would be of particular importance uh, just come back to that in a moment, but as an aside, we might bear in mind that in other regions, such positive steps to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons have been attempted, but they've been impeded by the refusal of one country uh, to permit the zones to go into effect. So there's an Africa a nuclear weapons free zone, but it can't go into effect, uh, held back by Washington's development of nuclear facilities in Diego Garcia, which is regularly used for bombing Central Asia. It's particularly true under Obama, who rapidly extended it to include uh, nuclear submarines and nuclear prepositioning. Uh, the, there's a Pacific nuclear uh, free war zone, nuclear weapons free zone. That can't go into effect because of U.S. insistence that U.S. military bases there uh, accommodate nuclear weapons. So that's more work for us to do. Make it public, do something about it. Well, coming back to the Middle East, uh, serious steps towards a nuclear weapons free zone would undercut any imaginable threat that Iran is alleged to pose. And there's no need to obtain Iran's acquiescence. Uh, they've been vociferously calling for it for years, uh, particularly as the spokesperson for the G77, the former non-aligned countries, which are strongly calling for this for years. Uh, what about the Arab states? Absolutely no problem. They're the ones who initiated the proposal, uh, starting with Egypt about 20 years ago. So they're strongly in favor. Uh, there's overwhelming international support. Uh, so why doesn't it happen? Well, actually, the matter does come up every five years in the NPT review sessions. And there's one problem. The United States vetoes it. That's why it doesn't happen. Last one was Obama in uh, 19, 2015. Uh, and the reason is perfectly obvious to everyone. Don't even have to bother stating it. Israel's nuclear weapon systems must not be subject even to inspection, uh, let alone steps towards dismantling. Uh, so there's various reasons given for this, but they're below even discussion. They're not even worth mentioning. We understand the reasons. Uh, and so matters stand. We cannot improve the uh, JCPOA in the obvious manner. It's important to add to this that the United States, along with the United Kingdom, have a special responsibility to work to establish a Middle East nuclear weapons free zone. They're committed to this goal. These two countries specifically are committed to this goal by a important Security Council resolution, 687, Article 14, if you want to look it up. Uh, it uh, commits the, uh, those who initiated and voted for the resolution, US and Britain, uh, to a move to establish a nuclear weapons free zone. And that commitment takes on even greater force because it's this resolution to which the US and Britain uh, appealed when they were seeking desperately to find some 
shred of a legal pretext for invading Iraq. Uh, well, it's another example that uh, illustrates the value of observing the supreme law of the land and even of referring to it, you might find, and see if you can find anyone even discussing these facts. Well, I won't go on, but case by case, if you run through the record, you'll find that serious investigation uh, does reveal the wisdom of the principles of the Charter and actually the principles of the founders who created the constitutional obligation to abide by valid treaties. Well, it could be argued, and indeed often is argued, that law, including international law, is a living instrument and its substance changes depending on prevailing practice, which would, of course, include the practices of the global hegemonic power. Uh, and we need not tarry on the conclusions that would follow from this line of reasoning. But concerned citizens should not tolerate these conclusions. And it's unnecessary to stress that a great deal is at stake in reversing them, reaching as far as safeguarding the future of humanity. Thank you. It strikes me, in terms of Professor Chomsky's original field of linguistics and his groundbreaking work, uh, that human beings have an innate capacity for language, that we also have an innate capacity for love and for seeking truth. And I think that in his other field of political and social criticism that Professor Chomsky bears that out as well. We do have a microphone, great. I was gonna ask if we did. All right, uh, a few questions, and I would love, love, love to have gender balance, and with your permission, I'm gonna try to make that happen. I wonder if you could comment on a thought that I've had over the past week, and maybe a lot of people had, that uh, North and South Korea are creating this unprecedented armistice uh, with the backing of China and Russia. Um, and I wondered whether that is looking towards a new axis of power, of world power, in which the United States would be less relevant than, and I'm being ironic here, than it thinks it would. Um, a corollary question to that is, do you believe that people like the people in this room and people across the country are going to be able to halt a Bolton and um, Pompeo-led march and frog marching, maybe frog march is the wrong word because he's so eager for it, Trump, um, to use the use of nuclear weapons? First part was the possibility of a new axis confluence of interest, let's say, between North and South Korea, China and Russia to counter U.S. power, especially U.S. threats to Korea. And the second one is in terms of, do we have the power as citizenry to stop Pompeo, Bolton et al. from catastrophe? The second, I think, yes, of course. I mean, there's plenty of things we can do to uh, reverse policy. With all the flaws of this country, it's still a remarkably free country by comparative standards. We have plenty of opportunities. About what might eventuate, you know, you've got to speculate, but I think something that's not unlikely, uh, if Trump's advisors have at least half a brain still functioning, they have a very simple policy that they can follow. Tell him to shut up. <laughs> Just stay away. As I said, prance around in public, talk about what a great deal maker you are, how you've overcome what Obama failed to do, uh, you made the great deal of the century, but just stay away, let them work it out, take credit for it, and then I think what's likely to eventuate is not a, a Korea, China, Russia agreement, but rather a development in Korea rather like Vietnam. Uh, in fact, I'll just tell you an anecdote. Uh, I went to uh, 
North Vietnam uh, in 1970, right in the middle of the bombing. There happened to be a brief bombing pause and I was invited to come. They didn't tell me the reason, but it turned out the reason was they wanted me to lecture at the Polytechnic University, or rather the ruins of the university during the brief bombing cause. So a couple of days I talked about everything I could think about. They run a very tight state, so you do what they tell you to do. Now, the first morning uh, that I was there with Doug Dowd and Dick Fernandez, who some of you know, uh, the first morning we were taken to a war museum where we sat for three hours listening to an incredibly boring discussion about the wars that Vietnam had with China in the 12th century and so on and so forth. And what they were telling us is very simple and anybody with a brain could have understood it. U.S. intelligence apparently didn't have a clue. They were telling us, look, you guys are bombing us, but you're going to go away. That guy up there is going to stay there. He's our problem. China's our problem, not you. You'll go away. We'll still have China looming. Uh, the war could have, I mean, this was so obvious. It took a I mean, uh, the inability to comprehend it is mind-boggling, but strength of ideology is such it couldn't be comprehended. And I think it's probably the same with Korea. Uh, we're going to go away, but China's still going to be there. And it's not unlikely that, if, again, if the Trump people have any brains at all, minimal understanding of the world, uh, they could pull out pull off something which would be good for the world for once and might end up with uh, Korea being kind of like Vietnam, you know, moving toward. You have to remember the power of the United States. It's overwhelming. Uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, U.S. decline. And if you look at figures like uh, uh, what's usually discussed, you know, GDP per, and so on and so forth. Yes, looks like a decline. But if you look at the actual figures, it's not a decline. You take a look at the proportion of the U.S. economy, of the global economy that's owned by U.S.-based multinationals. That's the real measure. It's about 50 percent. Uh, it's just nothing remotely comparable to this in human history. 50% of the global economy is owned by U.S.-based multinationals. They're first or second in every category. Uh, the U.S. runs the international financial system. Could be changed, but nobody's likely to change it. In military terms, the U.S. is so far ahead of anyone else, you can't even talk about it. Uh, nobody is going to fiddle. And, and the U.S. is a very dangerous country. It's a violent, brutal country. Nobody wants to take any chances with it. So I suspect that, uh, again, if the Trump people are thinking they could reach an outcome, which I'd be happy to applaud, even knowing that it's totally cynical and vicious and so on. And that's a very possible outcome, I think. Well, if I can just follow up, though, do you see the possibility that, at least in the short term, China might play a positive role in reaching an agreement as a guarantor of North Korea's security, at least in the short term? Well, I think China has been playing that role. I mean, they've been playing a pretty sensible role. Uh, in this case, um, there are other things that are doing which I think are totally unacceptable. But in this particular case, China has been, for years, calling for a diplomatic settlement and even proposing an obvious way to do it, perfectly obvious way. You start with a double freeze, move on to negotiations. Maybe you could get back to 2005, which was a very good agreement, not the only one, but a very good one, uh, that couldn't have played a more constructive role. So yes, I suppose they'll continue to do it. Uh, they don't want U.S. troops on their border. And they don't want U.S. troops in South Korea. Or collapse of the regime. Or the, certainly not the collapse of the regime. And it, incidentally, everyone understands, including U.S. intelligence, that the North Korean regime, which is maybe the most disgusting regime in history, but whatever you think about it, uh, they are trying to get to economic development. That's agreed on all sides. And they cannot do it as long as there's the crushing burden of an arms race. Actually, if you look at history, 
This is very similar to what was happening in Russia in the late 1950s uh, when Khrushchev came in. He understood that Russia was way behind the United States in every imaginable respect, military, economic, and anything else. And he wanted to reduce the military burden so that Russia could develop economically. And he actually offered the United States a sharp mutual reduction in offensive weapons. Uh, when Kennedy considered it, rejected it, and responded by the biggest increase in armaments in human history. Now that's one of the factors that led Khrushchev to put the missiles in Cuba to right, try to right the military balance. The other was the terrorist war. Now we should think about those things. In each one of these cases, there were things that could have been done that would have averted, in this case, almost terminal war. And it remains true today. The similarity, you know, Korea and Russia are different in many ways, but this similarity is a real one and worth thinking about. These things come up all the time. It's also worth remembering that if you look at the record of U.S. intelligence estimates, in very, almost invariably they've wildly overestimated enemy adversary capacities. It was true of grand forces in Europe, the bomber gap, the missile gap, uh, the Iranian threat, case after case, wild threat inflation, probably believed. Uh, one of the interesting things about Dan's book, Dan Ellsberg's book, from when he was on the inside at RAND, basically part of the Air Force, uh, is that he says they did believe fervently all of the totally false estimates. And it's quite interesting how the intelligence worked. That tells you something, too. Turns out that army intelligence was accurately estimating the Russian non-existent missile threat. Air Force intelligence was wildly overestimating it. Rand was part of the Air Force, so they did, too. Now, what does that have to do with budgets? Has to do with U.S. budgets. The Air Force wants the big budget. The Army didn't want the budget for the Air Force. Those are the considerations on which the fate of the world rests, as long as we allow it. Everyone, please thank Professor Chomsky again. The International Atomic Energy Agency, a concurrence of U.S. intelligence has repeatedly given Iran a clean bill of health. There, however, is virtually no talk about the fact that the U.S. has been violating the agreement from the very beginning and is continuing to do so.